we knew it. You weren't hearing this on cable news that these elections were gonna come down to what was going on in the schools. I think of you guys as like the antithesis to like mansplaining. Cause I feel like Fox News was like, let me mansplain your school to you and what's going on. We gotta address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast for red, wine, and blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Rachel Vindman. And you're listening to the Suburban Women Problem. Thanks for tuning in. It is such a big week. There's an election, and I got to talk to Alyssa Milano. I mean, how much bigger can you get? But it's also a little scary, right? We're recording this on Monday, the day before the election. And by the time it comes out on Wednesday, we'll hopefully know the results. And later on in this episode, we're going to talk to Katie Paris, the founder of Red, Wine, and Blue, about all the amazing work suburban women have been doing across the country in the lead up to election day. But this week's election and me getting to talk to Alyssa Milano aren't the only things happening right now. We also just got some disappointing news. It looks like paid leave is going to get cut from the spending bill. I feel like I've gone through all five stages of grief. And Rachel, I know you have some strong feelings about it too. Yeah. So I get it. I get the frustration. I've actually worked through my feelings on this pretty well because I'm writing something on it. And um, and that always helps clarify you know, really what I feel. Mm. And you know, when I distilled it down in writing... You know what I was mad at? Or who? The 50 Republicans. Yes. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a who. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I think they are completely getting left out of the conversation. We have given two people the spotlight and completely left 50 Republicans who will run on the things that are in the Build Back Better Mm -hmm. Act. As soon as it passes, they will run on these things. They will say, look what I did for you. And they are all going to vote no. And I think that is being lost in the conversation. Yes, Not to discount the fact that what is happening is disappointing and frustrating and it infuriates Mm -hmm. me, but I think we cannot ignore that 50% of our Senate are not going to support this. Not a single one. No one's following them in the bathrooms. No one's like going to, I mean, I saw that Kristen Sunman was a guest at a wedding and that people were there like protesting and harassing the mother of the bride was like, came out and was like, come on guys, stop. You know, look, regardless of how you feel about her, come on. It's someone's wedding day. I mean, but I get it, though. Like, we expect Republicans to be against this stuff. So it can feel especially disappointing when the people you feel should be on your side don't have your back and aren't on your side. And then you can, and it's not just being on our side, but when you pull most Americans, most Americans support a federal paid leave program. We're the only developed nation in the world without it. So it feels, yes, disappointing that Republicans don't support it, but it can feel even more disheartening when Democrats don't support it. And moderate Democrats. This should be moderate. Well, when I yes, read that- I agree. When I read that um, that Joe Manchin, who um, is a man and a multimillionaire- <laughs> Who doesn't need paid leave. <laughs> yeah. There are so many things there. And he's against it. And like, I, I don't know if you have been to your state recently, because I know you do live on a houseboat, but- A lot of people in that state don't have access to paid leave. And need it. Why would he be against it? I mean, it's it's crazy to me that he's against it. Like, but we have to frame the messaging, not what we're not getting, because that's what they want us to talk about. Oh gosh, when I say things like that, I feel very QAnon-ish. But <laughs> you know, it's important to say, I understand why you're upset. Like, I'm done with paid leave. It's not gonna affect me. But you know, to my sister-in-law, who's eight years younger than me, it's a big deal to her. And right. I mean, but you don't know that it's not gonna affect you because it's paid leave is not just about newborns. Paid leave is also about your husband gets sick or your mom gets sick. True. But again, it's about messaging, right? Everyone might need this. You might not need it right now, but tomorrow you could get some real bad news and suddenly you need it. Mm-hmm. And so again, part of the paid leave is is about messaging. Yes. But also like With the frustrated, I mean, I was so frustrated one night, like just, I had a day and I was frustrated and I'm ranting to my husband and he usually lets me rant for a while. Right. And I'm ranting, like, I just don't get it. Like we know that the best companies in this country, like high tech, large tech companies, they have the most generous paid leaves. Why? Because they need high skilled workers. And in today's economy and America's economy, we need to do the things that get us the most high skill, high ability workers. So to me, right, kind of the heartless economist, right, this is actually about creating an American workforce that's the most productive. And not doing it 
is not good for our economy. And so I was just like ranting with my husband, like, oh, I can't believe like we have research on this. We know this. And then he eventually got sick of it, which is fair, right? I get I get that. He got sick of it. He's like, okay. <laughs> that never happens in my house. <laughs> He's like, stop. Universal pre-K is still in this bill. And I could just like feel it melt away. And I was like, fair. I like that. I'm into pre-K. And he kind of flipped me. So in Alyssa Milano's book, which we got to talk about, right? She says, I don't want to burn. I want to build. So he kind of flipped me from this like wanting to burn <laughs> to wanting to build. I am ready to build. And pre-K is my favorite policy. I love it. As I'm listening to y'all talk about this, I just think about all of the things that like uh, Black people have had to fight for yeah. for so long. And this is this bill is amazing. I love it. I also know what it feels like to be disappointed. I mean, we'll talk from a place of privilege. I'm not used to being disappointed, right? I'm not. I'm just not used to being disappointed, right? And so the feeling of disappointment is maybe a little more new for me. There are so many people in this country who have lived longer than I have, who have seen bigger disappointments. Right. <laughs> and so I think that perspective is so important. Yeah. And and that's not to discount like how people feel yeah. about it, but I'm just saying, I think that sometimes when I look at the, I, I, I think I don't have any choice but to look at the bigger picture. Otherwise, life would be really depressing. Let's be honest. Most policies don't focus on people in the middle. Mm -hmm. Most policies don't focus on the majority of Americans. They focus on the people at the top and hope that those people at the top have mercy on everybody else and give us jobs and give us money and all that stuff. Trickle down. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say trickle down economics. But- when you do that, I think you start big. You you start with something. You just ask for every freaking thing that you want, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. knowing in your mind that you're probably not going to get every single one of these things. Like Look, the health care bill. When we had the Affordable Care Act, it exactly. got cut down. And we now have so many more people who have access exactly. to health care because of it. Is it the bill we all wanted? No. I, I think very few people would say that was the bill I want on both sides. But so many people now have health care because of this bill. Exactly. And so I think that we have to like think about policy making as something more than just what I want is what I want. We have to think about policy making as negotiations. Look, I don't know how many people live in the in our listeners' houses, but it's just me and my daughter. And sometimes even she and I cannot agree on something that should be be simple to agree on. And that's just two people. Now multiply that by 50. There are a hundred people, there are a hundred senators that we're trying to get to agree. All right, let's exclude the 50 that we already know are going to vote. No, that's still 50 people. I think that's an important perspective because also I think about this feeling of if you don't get your way, getting pissed and wanting to burn it all down, right? This is how we got to January 6th. Those people were pissed too when they didn't get their way right? And that's how they responded. We cannot have a culture of when I don't get my way, I burn it all down because that's how you get to January 6th. That's an important point. You know, I just think that we have to be careful about what we do with our emotions. Emotion, we will have them all day, but it's how we channel them. And I think just going forward, like to me, whenever I'm frustrated with something or something's not the way I want, the first thing I want to do is say, have a plan of how I'm going to move forward. And part of the plan in our country right now needs to be showing up to work for every election because only when people ask me this all the time on Twitter, like, how can I make a difference? Like you can work for the candidates you want to elect, have a plan, get involved. And I, I find that when I'm doing something, I feel better when I'm just sitting back and thinking about it, it's hard. But when I go out there and I do something it is energizing. Well, speaking of doing things um, and working, again, I, Alex and I have been working a lot, um, you know, over the past couple of weeks and a real push to the end here for the Virginia election, fingers crossed. Last week, I got to meet Katie Paris in person, which was fun. We did a school supply drive outside the Loudoun County School Board meeting. Um, it was positive and fun. And we have people coming up to us and just giving us school supplies for teachers. And again, it was doing something and it felt really good. Katie, welcome back to the Suburban Women Problem, this time as a guest. Thank you guys so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. It's been so exciting to get to be on the ground in Virginia 
after working all year long with women across this country who were facing these battles, these you know anti-mask, anti-vaccine, folks fear-mongering over what is being taught in our schools, so much misinformation out there. You know, it was really early in the year when people came to us and just said, help. And we've been connecting women, um, having our troublemaker trainings every week, women who listen to this podcast, women who engage with us across social media platforms, coming together to learn from each other. Because look, we knew it. You weren't hearing it from the pundits. You weren't hearing this on cable news that these elections were going to come down to what was going on in the schools. But we knew it, right? Because we were listening to each other, seeing it in communities all across the country. And so, of course, now we see in Virginia, it's the it's the schools, the schools, the the schools that's going on in that campaign. And all these women who have been coming together all year are now organizing around this election and making sure that misinformation is not what determines the outcome. I think of you guys as like the antithesis to like mansplaining. Cause I feel like Fox news was like, let me mansplain your school to you and what's going on. And I feel like what you've been doing is elevating women's voices saying, okay, Stop mansplaining our schools to us. Let me explain to you what's going on with our schools. And I love this elevating women's voices. Is there a woman that you have met that has like a particular story where you're like, this one, this is the voice people need to hear, not Tucker Carlson? You know, I have been struck throughout this year and definitely now in these days leading up to the election by women who are both moms and teachers. You know, yesterday in Loudoun County, Uh, The Red, Wine, and Blue crew got together and we were doing this text bank, reaching out to women all across the county and MSNBC was there as well. And there was a a teacher who spoke to Chris Jansing with MSNBC and was sharing how she is fired up and motivated to uh, not only vote, but reach out to other voters in this election because she just said, as a teacher, she is tired of, you know, being told, her ju- her judgment being questioned. I think oftentimes when people engage in politics, they think that, oh, the campaigns must have already thought of this. They know what they're doing. They're the experts, the political consultants, the people who handle you know all the TV ads, they know what they're doing. Oh, don't get me started on political consultants. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the look on Amanda's face. You guys can't see it, but you guys, I was looking straight at her because I knew what she was going to have look on her face. And it was exactly what I thought maybe better. Well, Rachel, can I just give the most amazing example of this? Okay. So yeah. we got together with you and other moms in Virginia, and we knew that there was a, you know, just a missing piece of the message in terms of what moms wanted to say back to all this fear mongering of what's going on in the schools. We wanted to stand up for our values and we wanted to call out what the other side was doing. And we wanted to say, we know you're trying to deceive us, but we're not gonna sit out. We're gonna vote. Yep. And so what did we do? We got a whole bunch of moms together on Zoom and we created our mm-hmm. own grassroots TV ad. And now that ad is running on television because- Oh, it's those a great ads. I love it. Also, Cindy Vinman and I do not live in like a uh, you know 19th century Edwardian um, home. We were just uh, out of town when we filmed <laughs> it. So- all the wood paneling, it's not really what our homes look like. Jasmine I, I, does do tea time. I feel like she's the closest to Downton Abbey. So Jasmine, <laughs> what do you have to say about the disconnect between what the voters want and what the candidates are told to talk about? Let us in on the secrets. I will say this. There are people that are in the political bubble that want to hear certain things. And they are so connected and they show up to every political meeting and every forum and every, you know, this and that. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. If a hundred people show up to a town hall, I'm like, whoa, a lot of people show up to town hall. Guess how many people actually vote for me? It is like thousands of people. And that is my reality check that Yes, sometimes it feels like the house is burning down because this person is saying this thing or this, you know, this ad got run or whatever. And I'm like, oh, no. And then I'm like, actually, there are a lot of people that have no idea that any of that is going on. And the only interaction that they will have is the interaction that they have with me. So I I got an email from someone from my synagogue. Hi, Andrea. She told me she was a big fan. I didn't even know she was listening to it. And she was like, I feel just heard. I feel like my voice is heard when I listen to your podcast. And and Katie, 
I know that's the goal. That's that's not just the goal. It's what we try to do here. It's what Red Wine and Blue tries to do as a whole is making people feel heard. We hear all the time women who come back and they say, I had this conversation with a friend, with a family member, or I did this thing. I became involved in a new way. I would have never have been able to do it without the support of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And those are, you know, I love it when people post about those things because it's just, yes, yes, yes. And oftentimes women who have not wanted to engage in anything political before because, hey, I get it. You know, there's a lot of nasty stuff out there. Politics has a negative stigma for a reason. We want to destigmatize it for our women by creating a way to engage that feels supportive, that feels productive and constructive. And so, you know, I'm always looking to hear from women, oh, well, if this is politics. I'm all it. Yeah. And it's a good resource. Like I've seen a lot of people on there ask for like resources, like, hey, I'm having this discussion with my uncle or with my brother, and this is what they're saying. And I don't think it's true. Are there good resources where I can give good information? Right. You're not just saying, yes, no, I don't I love believe those you. Posts. Me too. I was like, oh, girl, I got you. I got that one. Or I'm like, oh, I don't know that. Let me see what other people say. That's right. And that is a different way of doing politics, right? I mean, a lot of traditional political organizations, it's tactics, tactics, tactics. And we really see community building as the prerequisite for everything. You know, that ultimately we're gonna be able to make real change in our community and not only be doing the right things, but be focused on the right things because we're actually listening to what's going on in communities if we start there. Right, so Katie, we talked a lot about what y'all were doing in Virginia, but uh, can you go a little bit into more detail about things that you're doing in other states outside of Virginia? Sure. So. Virginia is kind of the all eyes on for this election day since they have a governor's race. There's also a governor's race in New Jersey. But, you know, we have elections on November 2nd, uh, 2021, all throughout this country. And sometimes people are not aware of that. Turnout is really so much lower in what they call these off year elections. But, you know, what's on the ballot school boards and city councils. And I city think that we here in I Georgia. Have, Yeah, I have never seen an awareness that there is today of who is on your school board. Um, But, you know, turnout still is going to be low in these races, so every single vote counts. Text all of your friends and make sure that they know. Just be like, hey, girl, did you know there's an election tomorrow? And I guarantee you, you're going to have folks who who don't know. Post on Facebook, like, I voted. Yeah. You know, and look, it's a lot year to year. It is. My God, we just got over, like, COVID. I mean... Like, if you don't know, no judgment, no judgment at all. You do what is going to work for you, but just know that it matters. And just please don't be afraid to ask your friends to engage with you as well. People like to be asked, okay? People like to feel like they're doing something. And especially in these local elections, it does not take much to have a huge, huge impact. We're going to stick around. The suburban women problem ain't going away. Um, and it's just exciting to me to see that even in these um, off year elections. And look, I mean, it's the moms who are paying the most attention to what's going on on school board. So, hey, ladies, let's uh, let's roar this week. Let's do this. Katie, thank you so much for joining the show. I am so excited to hear more about what Red, Wine & Blue does. And I love watching the organization and see where it goes. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. I hope you know I'm your biggest fan. Thanks, Katie. Now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have my interview with Alyssa Milano. We'll hear about her new book and her life using her Hollywood star status to elevate the voices of people fighting every day to make the world a better and more just and more equal place. So be sure to stick around. Do you feel like you could use some support figuring out how to respond to anti-mask, anti-vax, or anti-CRT messaging in your community? We invite you to sign up for one of our Troublemaker trainings. They're fun events where you can meet other women who are facing this stuff too, and learn strategies to stand up for the kids in your community. You can find more details in show notes or at mobilize.us slash USA. Our guest today is a woman who needs no introduction. 
She's an actor, an activist, and the author of a new book, Sorry Not Sorry. Alyssa Milano, thank you so much for joining us on The Suburban Women Problem. I'm so excited. And it's literally like the greatest name for podcast yes. ever. Oh, we're so excited to have you. <laughs> so I got to read your book beforehand. And reading it was like feeling I was drinking wine and talking with my friends. Aww. Can you tell us a little bit about Sorry Not Sorry? Why did you decide to write a book about your life and your political activism? I had been asked for, for many years to write a book about you know, various things about my life. And it just never seemed like the right time. And also, I didn't know I would be able to contribute something to this time, this moment in history. And so I uh, I just kept putting it off. And then I got this lovely offer from Dutton. And they said, you know, you're, you can write a book. You can do whatever you want with this book. And so my initial intention was to write a book about, you know, being an activist and a, a memoir of, of my advocacy work. And then I got sick with COVID. And suddenly just writing about my activism and advocacy work didn't seem like it was enough because something so personal uh, had happened to me, which is, you know, I thought that I was going to die when I was sick with COVID. And so it shifted to be a book about not only my advocacy work, not only my activism, not only, you know, my travels and my career and all of that, but also I really wanted to just give my kids a timestamp of, of this moment in history. And not just you know, the political and social structure, but like where we were as a family and what we were facing as a family during this difficult time. And I knew that some of those things would be taken care of in history books, right? So it became like, how do I tell a different side of this historical moment? How do I tell the story of our family history during this time in history? And so that's sort of what it evolved into. And it's a book of essays and it's a, it's a format I'm really comfortable with, but I didn't necessarily know it was going to be a book of essays when I first set out to write. I, you know, I, I wrote a couple of chapters that I had really liked. And then I was like, what am I going to do? How do I thread this to be like a, an overall, st you know, story of, my life. And then, you know, much to Dutton's credit, my editor's credit, they were like, maybe you don't have to thread it all together. Maybe this is just a book of essays, which relieved so much pressure because, you know, I write op-eds. It's what I, I've been doing for the past six years since Trump has been in office. So that's, that's what I did. I wrote from my heart. I didn't put any sort of pressure on myself, except that it would be interesting, um, heartfelt, and uh, somewhat poetic. I loved it. It made it so easy to read because it does read like a number of op-eds. So you're not jumping into a chapter like what happened in the last chapter. Each kind of chapter is its own thing. It made it very readable. Right. As a mom, like we don't really have, although reading is such an incredible escape, I don't know that we necessarily have you know, the time to yes. sit and, and, and really go head first. Books can be intimidating. I won't lie. Yeah. Cause you're like, what if I read a third of it and then I don't get to it for a year exactly. and then I'm like, well, do I continue? I don't remember what happened in the first third, but this book, you can jump it. You can almost jump it in any chapter. If you're like, this one looks interesting. You can jump right in and read it. Yeah. It's totally fine. I loved it. So you were mentioning when you had COVID. So I love in the book, you talk about your daughter in all her sass because I have a four-year-old where everything is in all her sass. Uh -huh. But what did you think when you're writing this book about when you got COVID, did that change your perspective about the state of public health in this country and what it's going to be like for our kids? I mean, not just in this country, but globally. We've never felt so connected to every country. Oh, yeah. But like also totally disconnected because... Our country is not doing enough to vaccinate the most vulnerable in the world. And so I think that's something that we're not talking about enough. I know when I was growing up and I would watch the news, there was always a section of world news, right? What was happening internationally? Hmm. I don't feel like that really goes on anymore. Enough. Oh, that's a good point. No. Um, and, and what that 
allows for it is this idea that we are all separate and that we are not the same and that we are not connected. But listen, th- we are connected, especially in the middle of a pandemic. You know, I've said it many times before, nowhere is safe until everywhere is safe. What is so much different about the pandemic this time than the flu, the, the 1918 flu or 17, whatever it was. Yeah, ni- yeah, the Spanish flu. The mm-hmm. Spanish flu is that you could travel anywhere in the world and be anywhere at the most in a 24 hour period. And so like we should we sh- we should be doing more to get everyone vaccinated. That's so true. Yeah, so you are you stay so engaged with what is going on and I think a lot of people in your situation might just kind of sit back and live a glamorous Hollywood life but you keep choosing instead to get involved. And I loved in the book, you had this quote, that one of my very favorite things to do is to give the microphone over to people who have important and special things to say and those who are fighting every day to make the world a better and more just and more equal place. So why do you decide, or why have you decided to become so active and to be out there? I don't really think that there's any reason to be a celebrity. to be famous if you're not going to use your voice to affect positive change and to make people's lives a little bit easier. And I think we're, you know, we're in a place in this country where we've gotten so where the way we look at at the government and politics is so lofty and so big and at the end of the day we forget that the government is made up of the small issues, the kitchen table issues you know, the, the food insecurity and the fact that people can't afford their medication and all of those things that that shouldn't need to be fought for, but that, you know, I feel it's really imp- important to, to fight for. And there are so many incredible organizations and activists that are on the ground um, in, in, in grassroots uh, advocacy work that, that uh, deserve more of a platform I'm blessed to have this big platform. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's it's a it's a social and civics responsibility, civic responsibility to use that platform to not only try to to make lives easier, but also to hand my platform over to those that are doing the, the work on, you know, in a boots on the ground kind of way. I love that. And you talk about, I know the book about how you, the time you have spent campaigning and your activism, that your perspective shifted kind of away from the candidates and toward people and the things that people need, that everybody needs. Um, and so one of the issues that you, uh, uh, you know, of the many that you focus on, but you're especially known for raising awareness about the Me Too movement in 2017. So what was it about that movement that spoke to you and made you say, this is something that I need to speak out and I need to speak out big against or for the Me Too, you know, for the Me Too movement? I I didn't know that there was a Me Too movement when I first sent out that tweet. I I was sent the screen grab that I included in the in the tweet uh, by my dear friend, Charlotte Clymer, who's an incredible trans activist. And it was, you know, we had been hearing two weeks of, uh, you know, all of the horrors that Harvey Weinstein uh, did to to women. And, you know, it occurred to me that it felt like all anyone was talking about was him and all the things he had to lose. It really uh, triggered a lot of my own personal experiences with um, gender-based violence and sexual assault. And so when Charlotte sent me that screen grab, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this out there. Let's see what happens. Not expecting, I mean, who could have expected what happened to happen? Uh, The next morning, I I woke up to 38,000 replies to my tweet. You know, in any movement space, it's the people that make the movement. And it just started, people started using it as a hashtag. My original tweet did not use it as a hashtag. It was just type me too. And then by like day three, I had learned of Tarana Burke's work, which I had no idea of. And I was so, I was so grateful (laughs) because I was feeling so much about my, my own stuff that I, I felt like I was not capable of leading this kind of moment, you know, and, and so thank God for her. 
and then she was so gracious enough to to understand like that I was also maybe going through some stuff so I don't remember exactly which day but less than a week from when the tweet the tweet was went viral she called me up and she's like you know what? I was just thinking about you how are you doing oh I was like oh, I'm not good I'm not okay <laughs> You know, and I was so grateful to her for just having the empathy to know that this might have been difficult. You know, I mean, why is it so important? I think, A, to give, to take the power away from abusers and put it back into the hand, or not back because it was never in our hands, but to put it in the hands of survivors, I think was really important. I think also to stand together in a sisterhood um, and not feel uh, that we had to name someone or out someone or say exactly what happened to us, but just to stand in solidarity with one another is what made that so incredibly uh, important and powerful. Yeah, you talk about Brett Kavanaugh in the book. And I remember thinking as I was watching those hearings of Brett Kavanaugh that it felt differently for a woman who has been through past traumas that had to do with assault, just watching him. And also, you know, it just, it felt different. It brings back things differently to women. Yeah, I think it's why that word, it, we get triggered. Yes. That's like a real thing. Like I think women, women throughout this country were triggered that after the Me Too movement, that there would even be a consideration of appointing a sexual abuser onto the Supreme Court. And, you know, it's, it's so wild to think about how, how right we all were. You have a way in your book of saying things very directly. And so when you were even talking about gaslighting in your book, it hit me in a way where I didn't even think about my own experiences and the gaslighting that happened from people around me who saw what happened to me and know what happened. Right. And were still gaslighting me. And I took some of that. And how about the fact that I thought I was okay? I had pushed it all down for so long and I, I equated that to being okay. And after Me Too, you know, after Trump was elected, after the Women's March, after seeing powerful men being held accountable for horrific things, I realized, you know what, I'm not okay. Mm. Like, I need to figure out how to heal because people just gaslit from the second I was abused to make me feel like, you know, that, that I was, I was the one that, that, you know, the victim shaming is a real thing. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So there's a documentary, The Invisible War, which is about assault on women in the military. I've it's seen amazing. it. And so I left that we got to see a showing and I left that movie crying and and it was interesting because even when things are going right with the Me Too movement I mean the Me Too movement itself is triggering because you finally feel like someone is standing with you and seeing like other people stand with you is like this I don't know release and I feel like in the Me Too movement I feel like so many women were ready to like let go and we're all standing together. And it was this amazing, amazing thing that happened in this country that you were, uh, you know, a big part of it. Globally. Globally, you're right. The first week I got a call from UNICEF saying that there were four girls in Ethiopia, in a village in Ethiopia that went, that came forward to say that their teacher was abusing their power and abusing them sexually. And imagine, I mean, that's the beauty of, of the internet and social media though, is that you know, that it can travel across the globe. And it also reminds me of you, you talk about allyship and that and we do need allies, but we also need to be good allies and realize we're not perfect allies. Mm. And, you know, I think that was a very, you know, I kind of connect both of them and thinking about how do we build allies and keep our allyship strong, you know, with, you know, women, you know, maybe who have not gone through an assault or, you know, with people who don't look like us. I don't know how we're able to really to, to grow from Me Too, you know, and, and what that means for gender-based violence and uh, discrimination um, based on gender and, and everything if we don't have white cis men in the fight with us. And, and it's okay to be an ally and make a mistake. 
like I just said, cisgender men, it's okay to not know what that is. You have the internet, you can look it up. I don't want people to feel like you have to be a perfect ally in order to make a difference. And I would even say that the communities that are oppressed that we choose to be allies for don't expect us to be perfect, but they do expect us to educate ourselves. And the responsibility of educating ourselves shouldn't be uh, placed in the hands of the people who are uh, oppressed. It's up to us. But it's okay to get it wrong sometimes. It doesn't mean that you should stop trying to be uh, an ally. You know, I always say I've messed up so many times in, in being an activist and being a good ally for so many different causes. And I'm going to mess up again. But hopefully the next time I'm going to mess up less or mess up in a, in a more graceful way. You know, and and I think that's important. I think that people need to know that. So you're in the public eye and you're talking about, you know, messing up and you're the target of a lot of criticism online. I am. For, as any activist is. That's weird. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so how do you find the courage to keep putting yourself in that position day after day and how do you handle it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how I handle it except that I feel like I've been criticized my entire career for something. So I think maybe I've learned how to have a tough skin. I don't know. You know, and it's something that we talk about a lot in my therapy sessions because I think that it is something that is almost like I've gotten to this point where I've just realized that the mission is more important than my ego. I remember having this kind of like this weird protection mechanism during the the Trump administration when people were saying hateful horrible things or threatening my life or my kids life I would imagine that someone was being paid to write those things and that real people were not writing them that doesn't mean I don't listen to opposing views but the people that are so hateful and horrible you know or harass me and then hide under the the shield of the their first amendment rights that those people were, um, you know, in some sort of social media farm where they were being paid to harass people that have social and political impact. So I think all of that combined has has really um, just made me feel like the mission is more important. Like I, I can't I can't get bogged down in what people think about me. People have been trying to cancel me since the 80s. We know who's the boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like I can't I can't I can't expect uh that to stop. Um and I I get it. I do. You know, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that as as we are on a very specific side of a of a political ideology, there are people on the other side that that don't agree with what we're doing just like we don't agree with what they're doing. And I think that we have to listen to each other otherwise uh we are 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 going to be a nation that continues to obstruct the other side. And the problem with that is then people do not, people still can't afford their medication. People still can't put food on the table. Um, You know, people are still uh, one paycheck away from total financial ruin. And that is what we have to focus on fixing. Yeah. Yeah. And those are important things. And they're bigger than any political ideology, in my opinion. Yeah, so your book was kind of very uniting, kind of that you you we need to listen to their side, but sometimes we just need to call the BS when it's BS. Okay, now we're going to jump into some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I I hope so. <laughs> What's a character that you've always wanted to play but haven't gotten the chance yet? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I would love to play an astronaut. Oh, that would be so fun. I would love you to play Jane Jacobs, who's an urban planner, but not, maybe not as exciting as the astronaut. <laughs> All right. Who is the best on-screen kisser? Or do we not kiss and tell? Um, the best on-screen kisser? I'm going to say Jason George Ooh. from Mistresses. Ooh. All right. Besides yourself, of course, who's the best TV witch of all time or movie witch? Ooh. Um, Glenda the Good Witch. Ooh, Glenda, nice choice. Now that it's fall and the weather is getting cooler, what is your favorite cozy fall attire? (laughs) 
my husband's clothes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love a good oversized shirt. They're so much more comfy. I'll even wear his jeans sometimes and just roll them up Ooh. with my with my Doc Martens and like a cozy hoodie and be good to go. Oh, they're the boyfriend, the husband jeans. Nice. All right, so you have nine horses, eight chickens, two rabbits, and five dogs, I think. I know we're not supposed to play favorites, but if you had to, can you pick a favorite one? I, I can, actually. <gasps> My my star, my Ringo star, my Australian shepherd, oh. she is that dog of a lifetime, that Nana dog that follows the kids around, that makes sure you're okay if you're having a tough day. She's just that animal that, that you get once in a lifetime. Oh, my mom had an Australian shepherd and adored that dog, like would turn the lights on and off and yeah. They're amazing. She's so clued into what everyone is feeling, and it's so sweet. She should have been a service dog, and, and in a way, she kind of is. <laughs> oh. All right, that is the end of our rapid-fire questions. I know we can find you on Twitter at Alyssa underscore Milano, and we've dropped a link to buy your book in our show notes, but is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know about how to find you? Uh, TikTok, I'm on TikTok, uh, which I love. Um, I'm on Instagram as well under Milano Alyssa. But yeah, I mean, I love to hear from people and uh, I'd love to get some feedback on the book and what people think of the concept. So uh, anyone who's listening, who's read the book, please reach out and let me know what you think. Alyssa, it was so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here with us on the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you, Amanda. Take care. Welcome back, everyone. You know, it's so interesting to see the evolution of um, Alyssa Milano, who I watched on Who's the Boss? Who's the Boss? Way I back when. I tried not to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's interesting because another person who really lifts the voices of women is Connie Schultz, who um, wrote to me when she found out that I was going to be writing for USA Today. And she uh, wrote me the loveliest note. And she really walks the walk on that on, you know, raising up women's voices. And when I listened to your interview, I thought of Connie as well. And so and so many others, right? But just like, don't just say it, do it, lift up other women's voices, because others are watching us. And it matters. And I just think it's so, so important. I agree. I know. It's so fun to talk to her because she is like very thoughtful and in how she lifts other people's voices and in her activism. And we ended up talking a lot about the Me Too movement. Sometimes the mansplaining is like, oh, it's just a bunch of women complaining about things. And like, you know, they're crazy, right? But it's no, like we are standing up and we have something to say and it's something that can change. And even in the Me Too movement, I was thinking about this after the conversation, I was like, there are things we can do. Only 11 states in this country mandate teaching about consent. Mine isn't one of them. Rachel, yours isn't one of them. And Jasmine, yours isn't one of them. It's really funny that that's not just that that's not required in a lot of places because like 95% of the SHARP training, which is the military sexual assault training, because they, you might have heard, they have a bit of a problem with this. Mm -hmm. I look at that as a failure of education up to the point where you can make it all the way into adulthood mm -hmm. and still have to have extensive training on consent because you haven't been taught and, as yep, a child. Absolutely. And this is something very tangible, very fixable that we could do if people would just get out of their own way, stop arguing about mask mandates and, you know, uh, imaginary CRT curriculums and actually start talking about the things that really matter in our schools, like teaching consent so we don't have full-blown adults that if you're not in the military, you are not getting this training. So we have full-blown adults that are still very murky mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. consent. Why is this okay with us as a society? Let's talk about that at school board meetings. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> so toast to joy time. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> we, need, we need to flip it. All right, Jasmine, what is your toast to joy? Um, okay. So my toast to joy is going to be very, very weird this week. 
but I am very proud of myself. When I first moved into my house, I had this huge bed of ivy in the front yard and I loved it because it was like very low maintenance. I didn't have to do anything. But then after a while, I had these community cats that would come and bring me presents to my door. <laughs> and once they brought me snakes, I was like, okay, <laughs> ivy's gotta go. So I cleared the ivy bed with goats. And then wait, 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 wait. I you had goats come in and eat the ivy. Is that yes, what you did? I hired goats and had them come in and, and eat all the ivy up. Then I dug up all the roots and things. And so the next thing that I did, which I feel like such an adult about, is I planted grass. And so I'm like looking out of my window right now and I see the grass like growing that I planted and I feel so accomplished. Like this is probably the most adult thing I've done in the last two years during the pandemic. So this is my pandemic grass, but I'm like so excited about it. Like y'all just don't know <laughs> how much joy it gives me to like see this little project actually like work. And so I, my toast to joy is to doing adult things like planting grass seeds and having them actually pop up and not having real life grass in my yard. Oh, I think Oprah said her favorite color was baby green grass. And it was like the most specific <laughs> way to describe a color that I have never forgotten it. So it's like your little Oprah baby green grass. Exactly. That it's so, oh, y'all just don't know. Rachel, what's your toast to joy this week? My toast to joy is I think the toast to joy that I've had like 18 times because it's been a long haul. Um, <laughs> But we're one step closer to vaccinating my daughter at her school last week. um, We have masks. We have very good protocols at her school. But um, last week, there were quite a few cases. We had to cancel trunk or treat. I know a lot of people still have hesitancy. You go ahead and have your hesitancy. My family will be vaccinated. So I'll see you on the other side. The peace of mind is really worth it. No, seriously, it is really worth it just to know that they have that extra layer of protection in a world that does not really care how protected they are. It feels like a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm, we've been walking around like, we're like shots, 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 shots. (laughs) (laughs) So my toast is a little bit, no, kind of not similar. But one thing that my neighborhood did for trick or treating is we kind of, we moved it outside. And so most of the people kind of go to the end of their driveway. So it's outside. You don't have to knock on a door and we'll bring like fire pits out and we'll have chairs and we'll kind of sit out there. And it's been really nice because the parents will stop and chat and it's been like more fun for the parents to walk around. That change has been lovely. And I think my neighbor is going to stick with it of this changing of how we did Halloween. I did the driveway thing too. It's so fun. It is Yeah, it's so fun. I actually play music at mine. So I have a little speaker and I play music, but I did not have a fire pit. I was not prepared for how cold I would be. Oh no. So... Next year, definitely need a fire pit because I definitely was a popsicle for Halloween (laughs) yesterday because I was so cold. But it was all worth it. I love talking to my neighbors. I love seeing all the cute little costumes. It was just fun. We just had fun. I completely kept politics out of it. For me, it was about passing out candy to the kids. All right. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. We'll see you again next week on another episode of The Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our executive producer is Beverly Batt. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, and our video producer is Ashley Hufford. If you're ready to be part of The Suburban Women Problem, head over to redwine.blue and sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss a thing.